Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our afternoon discussion on the US-Europe-China triangle, a great decoupling. Since the beginning of the pandemic, China's central place in many global supply chains came to haunt the US and Europe. But the trend towards decoupling has started long before. With the new US President Biden, will the US-Chinese trade war continue? Which actions should the EU take to protect itself against economic coercion? And how should Germany position itself? We have a stellar lineup to discuss these questions today. Let me introduce our speakers. We have with us today from Berlin, Dr. Stormy Annika Mildner. She's the head of the Department for External Economic Policy at the Federation of German Industries, and she will be from January on the Executive Director of Aspen Institute Germany. She argued in a policy paper from last year that decoupling is not a sensible strategy for the US, go it alone is bound to fail. We also have with us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Professor Joseph Nye. He's a University Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus and the former Dean of the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He argued in an article in Foreign Policy, China will not benefit from the COVID-19 pandemic and the United States will remain preeminent. We also have with us from Beijing, Dr. Kei Jin. She's Associate Professor of Economics at the LSE. And she made the case that the coronavirus crisis could be the opportunity of the century for China to cement its place as a global power. And then we also have with us from Singapore, Professor Kishore Mahbubani, distinguished fellow at the National University of Singapore. He argued in his latest book, Has China Won? that the United States has lost its way and China has found its way in the past decades. Thank you all for joining us today. Dear Livestream viewers, you can contribute your questions and comments to this discussion via our platform or via Twitter using the hashtag Berlin Forum. And dear participants and speakers, thank you for joining us despite and coming together despite very different time zones for this discussion. Let's start right away with the tough questions. And my first one would go to you, Dr. Mildner. President-elect Biden reportedly wants to work closer together with Europeans on China in a bid for collective leverage against Beijing. So if a phone call comes from the new White House asking Germany to take collective action against China, what should Berlin's answer be? Should it be yes for the sake of transatlantic relations? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for organizing this uh, wonderful and very timely event. Um, so you said it's going to be a tricky question and I would say um, it is not an easy question to, uh, to answer. Um, maybe um, let me start with a couple of preliminary um, remarks um, before I then get to the center of the question. And the first one is, um, the assumption that um, indeed we will continue to have geopolitical tensions despite the outcome of the elections in the United States. It's not going to go away, it's not going to be rosy um, because the conflict is so much more um, than just about um, individual actors, persons. Um, it is also more than an economic, in than a conflict of economic interests. It is really a conflict about values, um, and, uh, and, and uh, a competition of systems um, and also a competition of spheres of influence. And um, this is important to, to, to keep in mind when we talk about also reactions um, to this, but that, that's my first preliminary um, observation, so, so, so to say, or my assumption, it's not gonna go away. My second assumption is that the EU um, and also Germany have been in the past um, been a lot of times in the middle between this great power conflict um, of these uh, big superpowers. Um, and I'm not saying that the EU is not an actor in itself and also um, pretty, pretty influential, but um, if the US and the EU are, so to say, heavyweights uh, in, in the boxing ring, we are, I would say, more medium weight. I wouldn't say lightweight, but medium weight. And um, while those two have been exchanging punches, Sometimes we got into the middle of, these, uh, of, of this fight. 
Um, because our decision making is sometimes slower, uh, we also have diverging views within the EU, um, and uh, our instruments are maybe not as sharp um, and and well targeted as they probably should be um, to make us a heavyweight um, in this in this power game. So that's my second second preliminary assumption, um, so to say. So coming coming to your question, what does it mean for Germany? Um, and I would say the first thing is we um, in economic terms are pretty small um, and our power comes from the EU. Um, so we have to go the way via the EU. So the answer needs to be, this is in a policy field if we talk about trade, where um, we need to take into consideration that it's um, uh, something which where we have given our competence to the EU level. I'm not saying that we are not very influential, um, but nonetheless, I mean, it, it is um, of EU competence. And that makes us actually so much stronger than if we were going, going alone. And the EU needs to formulate, um, and Germany should take the, a leading role in this, should form, formulate its, its interests and work together with the United States on issues like subsidies, forced technology transfer, um, but also human rights violations, um, and join up together with the United States to ensure a better level playing field with China. Let me take this- In the this... past four years, yeah. um, and, and I ended here, I'm sorry, yeah. I get carried away. <laughs> it's good that you interrupted me, um, but yes, so the way is via the, via the EU. <laughs> let me let me take this a bit further, push you perhaps a little bit more on this. Um, Economic Minister Altmaier, he warned a few weeks ago that German companies should reduce dependencies on China and seek alternatives in Asia. Does Germany's economic dependence on China limit its leverage when it comes to politically difficult decisions? I'm thinking of Huawei, 5G, the fate of the Uyghurs and Hong Kong. No, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, um, about 60% of our, of our trade takes place within the European Union. Um, the United States is our most important export market that already um, underlines um, how important other strategic or other partners are in this. Um, I'm not saying that the Chinese market isn't important. It is very important. Um, and that's why I, I think decoupling isn't, isn't, isn't the answer and is also not a possibility. Um, but let me say, um, for a long time, also German, German industry, German business had the hope that China would eventually open up, democratize itself, um, play a, play a um, better, uh, more constructive role in international relations. And this hope has been very disappointed. Um, and that led um, us at BDI um, to a recalibration of our position. Um, in the last um, three years, um, we put out a pretty, pretty substantial policy paper, which also um, uh, made some headwinds um, in, in Brussels and also in Washington, um, where we did very clearly um, formulate that we need to have a tougher stance towards China um, to make it more play, play by the rules. Um, mm -hmm. So the answer is, is, is no, no decoupling, but at the same, same time, we need definitely a tougher stance towards, uh, towards China and sharpen our instruments um, in, in the trade sphere. Thank you. Um, let me take this to Professor Nye. Um, Anthony Blinken, the U.S. new State Secretary, U.S. State Secretary to be, he also argued that it is unrealistic and a mistake to fully decouple from China. But at the same time, President Biden will be under pressure, under a lot of pressure, not to appear soft on China, since at least it seems that in Washington at the moment, a hard line on Beijing is one of the few issues where Republicans and Democrats can agree. How much room for maneuver will a President Biden have to adjust policies towards China, but also towards Europe? Well, I think there's actually more consensus here than, than meets the eye. Uh, there has been a, a debate in Washington recently about decoupling from China and the uh, so-called new Cold War. This really is uh, exaggerated political rhetoric and not very useful as a way to think about the problem. And fortunately, uh, Tony Lincoln and Joe Biden don't participate in that type of rhetoric. There is a, a problem, which is there's some areas where there will have to be decoupling uh, 
which touch security. Uh, the pandemic reaffirmed this in people's minds that supply chains have to think of just in case as well as just in time. But I think the uh, important thing to realize is that complete decoupling economically would be foolish and that um, in the ecological area of areas like climate and health and so forth, uh, decoupling is impossible. As I argue in the new book I published, Do Morals Matter? We have to realize that there is a, a power over others. For example, American competition with China over the law of the sea in the South China Sea. There's also power with others in which you can't get what you want if you try to get it alone. And if you look at areas like climate, which is a top priority for Biden, and you look at areas like pandemic, which is a top priority for our country, uh, you can't do this without cooperating with China. So the idea of decoupling that makes no sense when you refer to these ecological interdependencies. So there is a middle ground here. And if we can stay away from these uh, hawkish statements and these uh, exaggerated metaphors about a new Cold War and ask how do we uh, uh, find a way to compete with China and or cooperate with China simultaneously, I think that's very much the approach that the Biden administration will be taking. Thank you, Professor Nye. If we look a little bit deeper into, into domestic politics, it seems that there are deep divisions on the issue of trade within the Democratic Party. So we have moderates that see trade agreements as a key to American prosperity and peace. And then we have rather left-wing Democrats who blame trade agreements as being responsible for hurting American workers. So how can Biden balance progressives and moderates within his own party? Well, uh, that's a problem actually in both political parties. Under Trump, you've seen that uh, the suspicion of trade agreements uh, is, has now changed the position of the Republicans. Remember, it was Trump who withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the Obama administration had negotiated. Uh, whether Biden will be able to rejoin the TPP or not Uh, or it's now called CPTPP, uh, uh, is very much questioned in domestic politics. Uh, but the idea of trying to play a larger role in trade uh, is, I think, something that's shared in the administration, but the domestic politics of how you get this done, it, you're correct, it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... Dr. Jin, you argued in a recent article that Beijing's worst nightmare would be a visionary U.S. president with convening power. Is President-elect Biden this visionary president and has Beijing's nightmare come true? Uh, well, I think there's uh, much to be seen uh, in that regard, and I don't think Beijing really knows uh, what it will be facing in the coming months. Um, but what is clear uh, is that uh, the U.S.-China relationship is an absolute priority for the Chinese leadership and maintaining as best as possible a relationship and, of course, improving upon it would also be its main priority. And uh, working uh, uh, on uh, you know, expanding the scope of collaboration will be a key theme with the new administration in the U.S., not only just with the U.S., but also with uh, Europe. I think the best way, or the way that I would, you know, we would characterize this, the nature of the U.S.-Chinese relationship uh, in China is a tripart system, which is politically oppositional, economically competitive, and global public goods collaborative, uh, as Professor and I have mentioned in all these areas. And I think it is possible to have coexistence Uh, and acceptance of differences, uh, having all of these three things at the same time, and that I think is really pretty much an accommodation to reality uh, rather than uh, some overarching goal. Um, I think that uh, um, uh, in terms of economic scope, uh, it's important to realize that Beijing is ready to talk. I think in the last few years, uh, both sides went straight to the fighting without the dialogue, And the new administration can hold a dialogue 
uh, and that is actually what the Beijing, you know, Beijing wants to see and can can hope for. I don't agree uh, with the fact that uh, China is going to maintain its economic approach and will have no chance of changing uh, some of the things that was mentioned. Uh, that was kind of yesterday's playbook. Uh, we have to understand that China has a new playbook, and the world is a little bit slow to catch up. Uh, there is a lot of indigenous technological efforts striving for independence. This is pushed by the U.S.-China trade war, but even more so uh, with a greater alienation of China uh, from the other countries. Uh, and there is also the brave, you know, kind of the um, the preparation for greater independence uh, on the supply chains and on trade. What, meanwhile, China still wants to emphasize that it wants to be an integrated part of the global economy, hence the dual circulation policy that it has put forth to embrace globalization, but also to be kind of more prepared uh, for independence. But also, lastly, I would add that China is going through the kind of the most, profa- the most expansive financial liberalization and opening up that it has ever seen in the last uh, 30, 40 years. And that creates a lot of opportunities and a level playing field for many of these foreign institutions. So I think it's fundamentally impossible to change China's economic model, which is a strong presence of the state, but it's definitely very feasible to have China change many of the approaches, to have China open up and to create this uh, open competition with foreign in- institutions. Thank you. Um, Stormy, Annika Mildner just argued that Germany should take a tougher stance on China. So what if a future Biden administration succeeds to convince partners and allies to adopt a tougher approach towards China? What would be Beijing's reaction? What would we have to expect? I think that Beijing is already prepared um, or it's preparing itself for this, uh, this scenario. And uh, uh, other than uh, trying to, I think China, uh, Beijing is very welcome to using the multilateral approach to have these negotiations and to um, have dialogues on many of these contested uh, areas. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, the reaction or the long-term preparation for this kind of scenario is for greater independence economically in terms of supply chain and most importantly in, te- in terms of technology. So I absolutely agree that in the sphere of certain kind of technologies, um, there we could see greater, uh, if not complete, severance, greater, uh, greater independence. Thank you. Um, Professor Mahbubani, um, last week we saw that 15 nations across the Asia-Pacific signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which brings together 2.2 billion people and around 30% of the world's economic output. Would you argue that this is a sign of China's rising and U.S. declining power, or is this rather more symbolic action than substance? Uh, well, let me say first that it's a real pleasure to be on this panel with my old friends, young friends, uh, Joseph Nye, Kiyu Jin, and to be with all of you. And my simple answer to your question is that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a real game changer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it's going to confirm in an accelerated fashion that the 21st century will be the Asian century. And the reason why it will be the Asian century is that the economic growth, or most of the economic growth of the world, uh, is going to come from Asia. And let me just give you one statistic that illustrates how fast things are changing over here so that you understand how fast things are happening in Asia. In the year 2009, the size of the retail goods market in China was $1.8 trillion, and United States was $4 trillion, more than double that of China. Fast forward 10 years later, in 2019, the size of the retail goods market in China is $6 trillion, United States is $5.5 trillion. And now with the dual circulation uh, uh, sort of a method of development that is being used by China, China is going to grow enormously. But at the same time, while I talk about China's important role, I also want to emphasize that the story of Asia is not about China alone. And I think that, for example, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with the Western media has been de- declaring is a Chinese proposal, Chinese effort is rubbish. 
<laughs> if China had proposed it, it wouldn't have happened. It would have died. The reason why it happened is because the 10 ASEAN countries uh, proposed it. And the 10 ASEAN countries had already signed free trade agreements with Australia, New Zealand, with South Korea, with Japan, and with China. And that's why it happened. So you, you, when you focus on China alone, you don't understand the Asian story at all. And more importantly, ASEAN very quietly managed to pull off a miracle because the three largest economies in Northeast Asia are China, Japan, and South Korea. And guess what? The three of them couldn't sign a free trade agreement with each other because of all the suspicions with each other. So guess who did this? Who delivered this trade agreement that got China, Japan, and South Korea to push aside their uh, suspicions and come together? That was ASEAN. And the reason I'm telling all this is that many Americans and many Europeans just don't get it. That Asia is a very different place and you have to understand the complexities of Asia and then you can deal with Asia. And at the same time, all of East Asia wants to work with the United States. All of East Asia wants to work with Europe. So when everyone sees these zero sum games, this sort of zero sum competition, you get it all wrong. And here I must yeah. say, I'm greatly encouraged by what my friend Joseph Nye said. He says, at the end of the day, there is a sort of a consensus in, in, in the United States. You got to compete, but you also have to cooperate. And I would say the message to US, message to EU is that Asia is ready to cooperate. Let's start now. Thank you for this passionate plea, Professor Mapubani. I'm sure that our other speakers on this panel would like to comment on, on, on this too. But let me follow up with one question since we are here at the Berlin Foreign Policy Forum um, in, in, in Germany. Um, Germany and uh, France have recently placed a bigger emphasis on the Indo-Pacific and have adopted strategy, strategies on the Indo-Pacific. There were calls for the EU to speak out more strongly on tensions in the regions. What do you think, how much leverage the EU and the EU member states really have in the region? Is this just talk or do you expect the EU really to have a serious role in the Indo-Pacific in the future? Uh, well, for a start, uh, two, two points. Uh, number one, Indo-Pacific concept. And by the way, incidentally, just, just to illustrate the complexity, there are many different Indo-Pacific complex uh, concepts floating around. There's one floated by Washington, D.C. and is by the Trump administration. It's an effort to bring together India as a counterbalance uh, to China. But there's another one promoted by Indonesia, uh, which is a much more inclusive uh, concept in Indo-Pacific. That is not, is not the rest ganging up against China, just to illustrate the, the, the example of complexities. But we would love to see India play a bigger role in the region, and which is why I can tell you all of East Asia felt very sad uh, when India, which had been negotiating for 10 years to join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, decided not to do so. But as you know, the RCEP has kept the window open for uh, uh, India to join, and we hope you'll do so. But in terms of what Germany and France can do, you know, if you don't mind, I'll be very candid with you. Please. We would love to see Europe play a bigger role in East Asia. But please be realistic, okay? I mean, this is not the 19th century where decisions made in Paris, London, uh, Berlin influenced the course of world history. I mean, that's the 19th century. We are in the 21st century. And so, and, and I can tell you this, all of Asia would like to see Europe play a bigger leadership role and especially a bigger leadership role in promoting global multilateralism in the way that Macron does so passionately with his speeches. We love multilateralism. Asia loves multilateralism. And frankly, at the end of the day, if you want to constrain China, guess what? The best way to constrain China is through multilateralism, right? So what Europe should do is give up any pretensions that it is some kind of great power still. It is not. But it can still play a positive role, but a realistic role which understands its limitations and say, okay, let's take the multilateral route. Yeah. And guess what? Asia would welcome European multilateralism. We would love it and we would support it passionately. 
Thank you, Professor Mahbubani. Let me take this back to Dr. Milner about the EU's role in the region. And as always, the problem with the EU is how to speak with one voice in a region or in a policy area. It was Germany's stated aim during the EU Council presidency to bring member states closer together, at least when it comes to China, to counter formats such as the 17 plus one from the Chinese side. But the EU leaders' meeting in uh, Leipzig with, was postponed and negotiations over an investment agreement are still dragging on. So has Germany failed its aim to bring the European Union closer together on China? Well, first of all, I, I think we need to see it also a little bit in the context of the corona crisis, right? Um, yeah. So some of the big ambitions for this EU Council presidency um, could also just not been fulfilled um, because uh, there was a lot of management to do with regard to stimulus packages and rallying um, the EU member states together um, to manage the corona crisis. And that is still um, a big, big challenge. Um, on trade policy issues, um, I could not agree more um, that um, the EU member states are a lot of times not um, unified, um, not just on the, on the matter of, of China, but on trade policy um, as, as a whole. Um, and this, is, this weakens the European Union, for sure. Um, and we need to, um, and, and, and you could also say that, um, that there is not, not, a, not a drift or rift, but um, it, it it's become even more difficult um, to negotiate, um, to sign and to ratify trade agreements um, in the last years. Um, and that, that definitely weakens the EU um, also, also in the region. I just looked up some numbers again. The US has four um, trade agreements um, in, in, in the region. The EU has six, is negotiating four others. Um, China has seven, but if you count the countries with which China has trade agreements, it's um, more than 14. Um, and um, that, that creates a sphere of influence and the EU is um, not lagging behind majorly, but, but a little bit. Um, and um, we do have to make, I think, some, some tough decisions um, with regard to how, um, how many things do we want to put into trade agreements and how high our ambitions are supposed to be. If I look at RCEP, for example, it's not that ambitious with regard to market access or with regard to rules, with regard to sustainability and so on. There are some countries in there which are our strategic partners and which are high standard countries, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia. We have an agreement with Japan with very high standards, really high standards also on sustainability. We negotiate, we are currently negotiating an agreement um, with New Zealand and Australia also with really high standards, um, but we are not, part of other um, initiatives because the standards are too low. So I think we have to be a little careful that in the end we won't be too much too alone <laughs> with following our high standards. I'm not, I'm not saying we should give up high standards, but it's, it's, it's a price to pay, um, something we definitely need into consideration. And that is currently a debate. The mm -hmm. EU has to, um, has, has, has to um, find an answer to. And that is something which is ongoing. So I'm not surprised that this isn't something which is solved um, in, in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months under the EU, uh, German EU presidency. That takes a little longer. We just have to be careful that the world doesn't move on too much without us um, in the meantime. That's a very good point. Um, Dr. Jin, um, it was interesting that during the first wave of the pandemic, there was a lot of uh, concern about the slowdown of the uh, Chinese economy and the consequences for the world economy. But it seems now that China's economy was the first into the COVID crisis, but also the first out. And that relates to what you just said about the new independence model of the Chinese economy. Now China is leading the way in the economic recovery from Corona. So what can we, what lessons can we learn from China in this regard? Is this model to become more independent, less dependent on experts, a model that in the end others should also follow to protect themselves? I think that um, greater um, independence, uh, uh, which is, um, it is something that countries should prepare themselves to, to be ready for, uh, mostly because the pandemic has shown that there is a certain fragility in the system. 
<laughs> um, and uh, but, but still, if we look at the data, um, it's very clear, and this, this relates to uh, the previous topic about trade. Um, it's very regionalized, right? There are three big countries uh, that are at the center of the global supply chain or production chain, uh, China in Asia, Germany in Europe, and the U United States. And most of the relationship is kind of, most of the linkages are regional. So I think that will remain. Uh, what is true is that there will be a greater need for a critical independence on, you know, let's say a PPE uh, and critical supplies, and that will change some of the economic strategies. But I don't think this is the right way forward. I don't think that all countries should just prepare for greater independence and have it. I think we mm -hmm. should just still emphasize on global cooperation and collaboration. But as you know, Professor Nye said, from just in time, perfect optimization and efficiency to also just in case. And there's a lot to be done. There's greater transparency in the information in supply chains, greater communication, uh, more diversification of suppliers. Lots of things could be done to have great more resilience in the system. And I just might want to add that even though China's economic numbers look like it's on the path to recovery, uh, two points here. One is the exports uh, figures didn't look that bad in China, much much better than expected, uh, because sim for, sim for the simple reason that China was the last factory open for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, we might not expect that these export numbers will be so great uh, the year after when the world starts to recover. So I wouldn't read that so, um, so, so uh, you know, on the surface. The second thing is that there's a big difference between rebound and recovery. Recovery, the path to recovery could be a very long time, maybe even 10 years, a decade. If we look at the recent crises in the last 20, 30 years in the West, in particular in the U.S., employment recovered uh, slower and slower. So it's very important to distinguish rebound and recovery. And in China, we're seeing enormous rebound. But again, to go back to the uh, pre-crisis trends, trend growth and development, um, I think uh, there will need to be a lot of work. And one of the most, one of the more important things is to prevent uh, this real economy uh, uh, issues to percolate into the financial system and cause a financial crisis, especially when we're seeing unprecedented levels of debt around the world. Thank you, Dr. Jin. One more uh, question to you. There was also this narrative, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, that we are past peak globalization, that this level of economic integration that we have has gone too far and perhaps brings more pain and less gain. Um, the idea that we are heading towards deglobalization, perhaps even. Does the data back up this narrative or wouldn't you agree, subscribe to this idea? I don't personally subscribe to this idea, and I don't think the data confirms that globalization is the biggest uh, cause of this growing inequality. I think the divergence between the elites and the general public, the elites and the grassroots, especially industrialized countries, is more of a domestic issue within these domestic countries than a globalization issue. If we look at what globalization has brought us, there has been more convergence, less global inequality uh, than there is more inequality. But within country inequality, especially in rich countries, have grown. And this is not uh, mostly due to globalization. This is primarily due to technology. So if we think about what are the main challenges for the world today and for each of the countries, these are, not, these are transnational challenges, right? This is artificial intelligence and automation displacing jobs. How do we have a new infrastructure to think about technology, to think about financial technology, how to regulate these technology companies? These are transnational issues. But yet we are focused on us versus them. We're focused on competition. We're focused on a zero-sum game. But we should be working together to solve some of the most fundamental uh, problems of the near future. Thank you. Um Professor and I, I would like to give back something to you that Professor Mapubani just said. Um, it's going to be the Asian century. You argued that the U.S. will remain preeminent, um, and the conflict between the U.S. and China, as Dr. Mildner said, is not only about economics, it's also about two different political systems and who will design the world order of the future. Why are you so optimistic that the U.S. will remain preeminent? And what can a President Biden do to revive the so-called liberal international order? Well, first let me say that I agree with my friend Kishore um, about 
Asia and the world economy. I, I wrote this in a book, The Future of Power, 10 years ago, that we should see the 21st century as not the rise of Asia, but the return of Asia. After all, if you go back to 1800 or 1700, Asia was by far the largest part of the world economy, as well as the world's population. So what we're seeing is a natural return of Asia this century. But as Kishore properly said, don't confuse the return of Asia or the rise of Asia with the rise of China. Uh, mm -hmm. China has risen, but notice that China is only part of Asia. And Asia has its own internal balance of power, which uh, means that countries like Japan, or the third largest national economy in the world, uh, India, the world's about to become the world's most populous country, and uh, Australia, uh, as well as countries like Vietnam and others, don't want to be dominated by China. They want to have a situation where they can benefit from China, the rise of China, but uh, they would welcome an American participation in the region because it helps to balance Chinese power. In that sense, the Americans have a tremendous advantage and asset, which is we're not directly threatening any of these countries, where several of the countries in the region feel threatened by Chinese power and Chinese growth. So that's why I think the Americans will continue to play an important role. In addition to that, if we look at uh, uh, power in a global sense, if the United States and Japan and Europe hold together, and they certainly, as, as uh, Ms. Mildner said, have commonality of values, if these countries hold together, their combined economic and political weight is much greater than any place that China will be in the next 20, 30 years. If you just ask, will China, Chinese economy grow larger than the U.S. economy in gross net domestic product, probably sometime in the 2030s, yes. That's not the same as, econo uh, as military power, where the U.S. has a much larger global advantage, and it's not the same as soft power, where the Americans, again, are showed by most polls to be uh, well in advance. But the key point is if we act together with Europe and with Japan, we can perform a balancing role in which you can shape the environment so that China can rise responsibly. And that means the prospects of a rule-based international order uh, are not so bad after all. So I, I go back to what uh, Kishore said, don't confuse the, the uh, fact that a Asian century exists uh, with the fact that a Chinese century exists. Uh, it's not necessarily a Chinese century. Many Asians welcome the United States participation, and as we heard, welcome European participation. You just said we should stay together and Europeans should stay together. Next year we will have elections in Germany, so the German Chancellor Merkel, who was dubbed as the leader of the free world a couple of years ago, will be gone. Are you concerned about this prospect? Well, I, I'm an admirer of Chancellor Merkel. I think she's done a remarkable job as a political leader. Uh, but I'm also uh, quite reassured by the structure of democracy in Germany. I'm sure there will be another German leader of, uh, of, uh, of impressive qualities. And also remember, that we, as, we, as uh, Ms. Milner said earlier, uh, think of Germany not just as Germany, but as Europe. And uh, when you put Europe together with its democratic traditions internally, and with its multilateral attitudes externally, um, I'm not worried about the fact that Germany will have elections next year. Thank you. Um, Professor Mahbubani, um, I would like to quote some uh, survey results from our Berlin Pulse survey that we conduct every year. And we've asked the Germans in Germany, um, and we've asked the Germans in this survey whether they think it is somewhat or very likely that the US-Chinese confrontation will turn into a new Cold War, a term that was already mentioned in our discussion. The result was that 49% of Germans said they think it is somewhat or very 
likely, and 47% said it's somewhat or very unlikely. So Germans are divided on this question. We asked the same question in cooperation with the Pew Research Center in the US, and there the result was that 59% of US Americans think it is somewhat or very likely that we will see a new Cold War between the US and China. What should be done to avert this fate, a topic very central in your book? Uh, well, <laughs> a very simple uh, answer to your question to avoid the worst case scenario. Read my book, <laughs> uh, has uh, China won? But, you know, I think it's a big mistake uh, to use the term Cold War. I mean, as you know, in Europe so well, during the Cold War, how much trade did Germany do with the Soviet Union? Like almost zero, okay? Now today, tell me, one in three Volkswagen cars are sold in China. One in four Mercedes-Benz cars are sold in China. One in four BMW cars are sold in China. And, and guess what? Where is the big new market for German products? It's in China. And, and by the way, I agree with, uh, I, I, I emphasize China, but I completely agree with Joe Nye's point that e Asia is much larger than China. And frankly, if you look at the market for Volkswagen, BMWs, Mercedes, it's also in Asia. So this is not a cold war. Yes, there will be a major geopolitical contest between the United States and China. And in my view, is driven by structural forces, by the fact that number one power always pushes down the number two power, is driven by the fear that yellow peril, is driven by the disappointment that China hasn't become a democracy, the structural forces driving this. But this doesn't mean that this contest is irreversible. I must say, I felt greatly encouraged in this discussion, listening to Joseph Nye, because I think if Washington DC listens to Joseph Nye and also acknowledges that this is not the old Cold War, the past, and indeed you have many, many common interests between the United States and China. The first common interest is COVID-19. And you know, frankly, if COVID-19 is an enemy of China and COVID-19 is an enemy of America, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. As we, that's why Winston Churchill fell in love with Stalin uh, to fight Hitler. But therefore, U.S. and China should work together first to kill COVID-19. It's in their common interest to do so. Secondly, global warming. And as I say in my book, if U.S. and China keep fighting while global warming is happening, future historians will see them as two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forest around them was burning. It's an absolutely crazy thing to do. That's what apes do, but not human beings. So if you are really smart, intelligent, thoughtful, we should understand that the, that the common interest between the United States and China in dealing with many global challenges are far more important uh, than the differences. And this is where, frankly, I hope Europe will come in. The most useful contribution that Europe can make is to say, hey, there are more pressing global challenges in the world. And that's what all of Asia is saying, by the way. Privately, whenever American diplomats come to Southeast Asia, there's only one message they hear from Southeast Asia. Don't make us choose. We don't get involved in this conflict. We have more important things to do. And that's what Europe should also say. So if Europe and the rest of Asia can work together to persuade US and China that there are far more important things for the world to do than to get stuck in this headlong conflict, then we would have made a very positive, constructive contribution. And frankly, that, that's the main goal of my book, Has China Won, to try and persuade them, stop this, stop this. There are more important things to do. And I hope Europe will speak out more loudly in that dimension. Professor Mafubani, we already have some questions coming in from our live stream. So let me take one question from there and put it directly to you. It concerns the Belt and Road Initiative, China's Belt and Road Initiative, which was criticized for um, creating debt traps to countries that have subscribed to this Belt and Road Initiative. The question is, is this really a purely economic project? Or to what extent does it imply a form of soft power ideology 
and international influence that could rival the United States? Well, uh, uh, two or three quick points. Point number one, there is no debt trap diplomacy. There is a peer-reviewed academic article, by the way, I think the author's mm -hmm. name is Deborah Brottigam. Google and find it. You will find that it is not true, absolutely not true that there's debt trap diplomacy. The data shows this. And by the way, countries choose whether or not to do this at the end of the day or not. And three, a common example of Sri Lanka and Malaysia that are given, Malaysians are still participating in the Belt and Road Forum. And the second point I want to make about the Belt and Road Initiative is that at the end of the day, countries can, are, are absolutely free to decide. There are 193 member states of the UN. They're absolutely free to decide. Do they want to join the Belt and Road Initiative or not join? It's free, complete freedom of choice. So United States is not joining. Japan is not joining. India is not joining. Australia is not joining. That's okay. Perfectly reasonable. You are free to, to join or not join. But out of 193 countries in the world, 127 countries have decided to join the Belt and Road Initiative. Are 127 countries in the world so stupid? Really? I mean, they don't know what, they, what is good for them? And, you know, I, I'll give you an example. Singapore's biggest neighbor, Indonesia. What is Indonesia's biggest priority? Infrastructure. Who's going to build the infrastructure in Indonesia? Who's going to give them prices that are reasonable? And guess what? Infrastructure lifts people from poverty. So there's perfectly good reasons why so many countries, all the countries in Southeast Asia, all 10, have joined the Belt and Road Initiative and they all want to build the infrastructure. So you please, I would strongly encourage those who hear the Anglo-Saxon narrative on Belt and Road Initiative to counterbalance it by looking at the data and looking at the facts. And I am very confident that the Belt and Road Initiative will become stronger and stronger and if we meet at the same time next year, more countries would have joined it. Thank you, Professor Mafubani. Dr. Milner, did you want to come in? Did I see mm, this correctly? Wonderful. Um, Please do so. Um, if I may, um, yes. on, on the keyword of counterbalancing, um, and I would take it to, to a different aspect of counterbalancing, because I do believe that the Road and Belt Initiative is more than um, an, eco an economic project, but it is also a project of um, in well, spheres of influence and also of spreading a certain governance model. Um, and I think we need to counterbalancing, balance this with an initiative. Um, and one which comes to mind is the Blue Dot Initiative. Um, and that would allow us in infrastructure projects, government procurement um, to implement and ensure some of the standards, which are dear not only to the European heart, but also to the American Hard. And when we talk about possible cooperation projects, I think that would be one um, in the transatlantic relationship. Thank you. Um, there's one question coming in from the audience uh, from Kai Brinkman, and I would give this to you, Dr. Jin. Professor Mabubani already commented on the RCEP, and Kai Brinkman's question is, how can, could China be hedged and kept from ultimately dominating RCEP, not only in economic, but in political terms? I, I don't think there's any uh, intention for China to export its development model. Um, uh, it has no uh, moral universalism like the U.S. in the post-war. Uh, I think that China presents an interesting case of study for some developing countries, but it by no means wants to export any kind of development, economic, political, or governance uh, models for that. And, uh, uh, you know, China wants to stress on a regional uh, cooperation uh, as, as uh, the discussion has revolved around, uh, you know, Asia is much bigger than China. Uh, that's, uh, that's definitely, you know, in line with its own strategic objectives as well. Thank you. Professor Nai, would you agree that China does not want to project any governance model? Um, there's also this narrative that the idea to bring China in into the um, global system, into the WTO, to make it a more responsible stakeholder has failed. Well, I agree with Professor Chin that uh, Xi Jinping's China is very different from Mao's China. 
uh, indeed, uh, in the 1960s, uh, people were marching through the streets or organizing in South American jungles uh, in support of Maoism. You don't find anybody marching through the streets in support of Xi Jinping thought with Chinese characteristics, as it's put in the Communist Party uh, constitution. Uh, so in that sense, I don't think China is trying to do an export model. What they are, and also not many countries can accomplish what China's accomplished. Uh, they, they don't have the domestic structure and population for uh, emulating the Chinese model. On the other hand, China is very concerned about um, protecting its authoritarian system. So it's quite prepared to use its economic power to punish countries overseas who might do things or say things that might uh, uh, seem threatening to Chinese Communist Party control. Just look what they did recently to Australia with their 14 complaints about Australia's raising the question of whether there should be an independent panel to look at the questions of the early transmission of the uh, uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, China has behaved very badly that way. You can find a whole number of cases where they punish countries uh, or groups overseas, basically protect against what they see as ideas that threaten them in China. So in that sense, is a soft power uh, threat. China is not a soft power threat to us. Uh, we are, for better or worse, just by our example, a soft power threat to them. And that means there will be some ideological conflict, but we ought to try to minimize it rather than maximize it. Thank you. And if I may add one more question to you in this regard, how do you expect tensions around Taiwan then to develop in, in the coming years? Well, the Taiwan question is a, is a very uh, potentially very dangerous uh, point of friction. The U.S. policy has been, uh, to greatly simplify it, uh, uh, no unilateral declaration of independence no use of force, and within the boundaries of that box let the two sides of the Taiwan Strait uh, negotiate their relationships. Uh, if, uh, as China becomes stronger and presses harder to get, get the, uh, uh, the pressure on Taiwan, uh, this could create uh, friction because the US under the Taiwan Relations Act uh, of the 1970s uh, says it has an interest and commitment to the security of Taiwan. So I think uh, the important thing we're going to see and going to have to see is ways to uh, maintain the status quo and let uh, evolution take its time. Uh, it's not impossible, but it is a dangerous point of potential friction. Thank you. There's one more question to um, Stormy Annika Mildner from Barbara Ponkwatz in our live stream. She asks, do you see any advantages for the EU and its companies if the US and China continue with the decoupling ambitions, especially in the tech field? So could there perhaps be advantages um, instead of only disadvantages for German and European economies? Well, an advantage it would be if we um, advance our um, strategic, also digital um, autonomy, but if we remain open um, and also sharpen our, um, our instruments to counter unfair trade policies, I mean, that would really be an advantage. It would not be an advantage um, if the uh, decoupling um, continues um, or... Um, if we get kind of in the middle um, of this great power game. I don't think that um, if two are fighting, then the third one is going to be the winner. I mean, the European Union strives from being integrated into global markets. Um, our prosperity, um, well-being, stability, but also I would say even peace depends on our integration into the world economy. Um, and um, it would certainly not, not be of our advantage um, if the decoupling um, continues. But at the same time, we do have to work on our own competitiveness. We do have to work um, on, on infrastructure, on education and research and development. We should do that 
independent of what's going on in China and the United States, because it's in our vital interest um, to be competitive um, and to invest um, resources um, in, these, in, 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 in these fields. And you said at the beginning that Germany is not a heavy weight, but also not a low weight. Um, can Germany mediate between the United States and China in the, in, the, in the coming weeks and months ahead? That's something that Minister, Economic Minister Altmaier suggested. No, because we have our own interests. Um, and a mediator <laughs> should, shouldn't, shouldn't pursue its own interests. It's a different, it's, I would say it's a different role. Um, so our role is to be... Um, to be a strong partner of those two players within the EU um, and uh, make sure that the EU defines and then projects its, uh, its interests in a cooperative um, and not only conflictual way. Thank you. Professor Mahbubani, one question for you from the audience. Um, Vera Phillips would argue that not every country feels free in their decision to join the Belt and Road Initiative and that the signature often comes with a credit treaty offering very favorable conditions. We've touched upon this before. The question is, could the US support the EU and other partners pushing forward their own connectivity strategy, thereby also promoting their own standard, which is one of the crucial aspects of the game? I would like to give this question to you and then also to Professor Nye to answer the question whether the US and the EU should support and promote their own standards and their own connectivity strategy in the region? Well, I think, uh, I think we would be very delighted uh, if the United States and European Union uh, came with uh, concrete proposals uh, to build infrastructure, uh, to fund it, and even to set uh, high standards uh, if they want to do so. That would be very, very welcome. But as you know, when the Trump administration proposed its, I forget what it's called, clean something, clean initiative, there was no money on the table. I mean, nothing, virtually nothing. I mean, compared to how much uh, China is prepared to contribute. And if you want to be really fair to China, let me say something, okay? If you look at the governance standards of the two big development banks that are in China, one is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, run by Jin Li Chun, and then the other one is a new development bank run by a Brazilian, Marcos Troyo. The governance standards of these two development banks are as high as ABB, World Bank. And, in, and to be honest with you, if you want to be really objective, they are higher. They're actually better performing banks than the World Bank. And, and, I, and so, you see, this idea that Asians can develop higher standards than Europeans or Americans is inconceivable <laughs> to many in the West. But that's what the Asian century is about. The Asians have actually learned the best practices from Europe and from America and are implementing them very well. So, and if, if and believe me, Asia wants to see more of constructive American participation, Asia wants to see more of European constructive participation, but don't lecture. Please don't come to the Asians and say, We've, you know, we'll teach you how to do things. We'll tell you what are the highest standards. We'll tell you what are the higher ethical standards. We'll tell you what are the higher values. That those days are gone, please, you know. This is the 21st century, you know. This is the 21st Thank, century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got to get used to a new texture in international relations, which is very different. Yeah. Where Asians may have higher standards than Europeans, and as demonstrated how, how, how we took care of COVID-19. Why is COVID-19 better managed in East Asia? Why? Professor Nai, do you want to answer this question? But I would also like to ask you about the connectivity offer that could be made by the US and Europe. Two countries well, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Please. Uh, there are some areas where we and China and other countries can agree on standards. There's some areas where we have to be careful about the standards that China's promoting. For example, at the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, China's promoting standards for what you might call the sixth generation, which will definitely be not very good for freedom of speech. 
They have a very different view of the internet than Europe and America do. So in those cases, it's important that Europe and America do cooperate to make sure that their standards would protect privacy and freedom of speech. And there are also some areas where the issue is not standards at all. For example, uh, on the issue of decoupling by not allowing Huawei to build the infrastructure for our fifth generation of telecommunications, it isn't a matter, a matter of standards, it's a matter of security. If China controls the 5G telecommunications infrastructure, it's a threat to our security. And you say, oh, how can we take that view when China doesn't? Wait a minute, 10 years ago, China stopped Google from participating in the Chinese market because it regarded the speech approaches of the internet that Google represented as a threat to Chinese security. So in some areas, uh, narrowly defined by security, there will be and should be decoupling. In other areas, we're going to have to make sure that the standards that are promoted are standards that protect our values, including privacy and freedom of speech. So in some areas, there'll be cooperation, no decoupling. Other areas, there'll have to be decoupling because of security. And still other areas, we're going to have to negotiate standards which protect our values. Thank you, Professor Nye. There are actually many more questions to answer, but our time is unfortunately up. And I know since we're in different time zones, it's already late in Beijing and Singapore, so I will close this discussion now. Those of you who still have questions to Professor Nye can join now a deep dive Q&A session with Professor Nye on our platform. You have to be a registered participant on our platform. For all the others, and for now, I would like to thank our panel for this excellent discussion of this topic. Thank you so much for joining us today, and our participants and our live stream viewers for these great questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you. With this, thank you. goodbye. And we will be back here at the Berlin Foreign Policy Forum in 30 minutes for a conversation on the U.S. role in the world with Samantha Power in cooperation with the German Marshall Fund, moderated by Karen Donfried. See you back at 4 p.m. at the Berlin Foreign Policy Forum. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>